incredible things happened in the region we now call Western New York along the Canadian border. Giant glaciers and rocks the size of Gibraltar scooped out the Great Lakes. And the overflow from that little project created one of nature's natural wonders, Niagara Falls. Annually, over a million tourists visit Niagara Falls, New York, to witness something that no postcard can possibly do justice to. I'm Steve Evans. If you visit the falls and stand this close on a blustery day, plan on getting wet. It's incredible the mist at 150,000 cubic feet of water a second, falling 192 feet, can create. Today, tourists are attracted to Niagara Falls for a roar of another kind. The Sports Car Club of America's Trans Am Sedan Championship, the inaugural running of the Niagara Falls Grand Prix. A street course of 1.5 miles with 15 turns, but not a slow street course as some of them we have seen in the past. This one will offer some tremendous speeds. And down on the grid is my buddy Brock Yates. Well, Steve, here in Niagara Falls, New York, we've got these streets more famous for strolling honeymooners, but today they're full of high-powered race cars. And we've got, as usual, some high-powered automobiles from Europe and some favored domestic brands. But on the pole from West Germany, the champion rally driver, three-time world rally driving champion, Walter Roll in the turbocharged four-wheel drive Audi. And let's have a quick word. His engines are fired up. Walter, are you? do you feel that the four-wheel drive Audi will have an advantage today. I think so, yeah. The track is fantastic for my car. Well, we wish you all the luck. We'll be watching you. I will need it. Thank you. What a contest we have in the front row for this race. Walter Rural, whom Brock just talked to in a marvel of German technology. And alongside him from Northern California will be this man, Willie T. Ribs. Nobody drives harder, but Willie had a bit of a problem in warm-ups this morning. The last Lindley owned number 80 Camaro got away from him and turned number one and into the wall pretty hard. Willie surveyed the damage and it was not good news for the crew when they arrived on the scene. The car had to be taken into the garage area, the engine removed, and out came the welding equipment to try to straighten the suspension and the chassis. As always, though, emergency repairs like this in the garage area are iffy at best, and nobody was quite sure whether or not they were going to get the chassis set up uh, back to where it should be for Willie T. But moments ago, those repairs were completed, and the car was rolled onto the grid here at Niagara Falls, where the third member of our broadcast team, Paul Page, is now with Willie T. Well, Brock, the car is here. It was a late arrival on the grid, but nevertheless, Willie T. Ribs is in the cockpit and ready to go. Willie, are you concerned about the car at all? I know that they were worried about the frame. Do you think it's ready to race? Well, you never know until you go a few laps to see how it's going to turn in and how it puts the power down and things like that. It just takes, uh, you know, I'll know in about five or ten laps how I'll be able to go. The problems that you've had in the past couple of weeks, several races with Scott Pruitt, is there a chance that those would crop up again here today? It's certainly the talk of the pits. Uh, you know, everybody would like to have a ticket sale and a lot of controversy, but, you know, you can't, you got to concentrate on racing and, and doing well and not worrying about where you're going to bang somebody or where they're going to bang you. Really, Ribs will start from a position that many think is the key position to winning this race on the outside of the front row. Now, let's go back to Scott Pruitt, who is third fastest qualifier in Brock. Starting right behind Walter Roll in this uh, Mercure, beautiful turbocharged automobile, the man from Roseville, California, Scott Pruitt. And Scott, uh, are you going to try to sneak through on the inside uh, uh, going down into turn one? I know this is going to be a tough racetrack to pass on, and you got to pick and Shoes. Is that going to be a place where you'll try it, or will you sit back for a while? I really plan on sitting back for a while. You see, with the V8, we can't go head-to-head -head with the uh, Audi or the V6s because of our added weight. What I'm going to do is just go out, stay out of trouble, stay on the tires, and try and come home with a decent. Okay, good luck. Thank you. And now, let's go to Paul with another man who's going to be a factor in this race. Well, Brock, back on the inside of the third row is Hurley Haywood and the other Audi. These cars seem particularly adept for this course. Are you satisfied with them? Yeah, I'm very satisfied. My Audi is 
likes these street circuits. This is very twisty. And judging from what's happened in the first two races, the pavement's coming up. So if that happens, we're going to be in really good shape. This is such a long race that uh, you're going to have to treat it like an endurance race. It's only 150 miles, but I figure that's going to take almost three hours to run. So we're going to run very cautiously, see where we are after the first hour, and then uh, do what we need to do to win. The problems they've had with the circuit, the all-wheel drive pays off? Oh, yeah. You know, the all-wheel drive is fantastic when the conditions are perfect, but when the conditions start to, to get bad, if it rains or, or if the surface starts to break up, we can put the Audi anywhere we want to, and uh, on a place like this that's so tight, uh, it's very important to be able to put the car where exactly where you want it. All right, Hurley Haywood. Now, all of these drivers and these cars face the same challenge, and that is this very tight street circuit here at Niagara Falls. Let's take a look at it. Just how close is the racetrack to the falls itself? Take a look. No more than a quarter of a mile. This is downtown Niagara Falls, New York, a community of some 72,000 people. The racetrack in the final analysis is actually 1.6 miles with 15 turns. Now, you can see where the pits are located, and that's a short pit straight that goes into the tightest part of the racetrack. Earlier in the competition, Chris Neifel and this Pontiac Trans Am took one of our Diamond P Sports cameras for a ride to give us a driver's point of view. Well, Chris Neifel is one of the real veterans of road racing. has brought all kinds of cars, including Indianapolis machines and the big IMSA GTP prototype. Right now, though, he's in Bruce Jenner's Pontiac here at Niagara Falls. Here's the first part of the course that will challenge these drivers today. That is turn one and two, just past the start-finish line, which is located at the center of the pit straight. It is very narrow, but surprisingly here, some of the braver drivers will try to pass under braking. Well, here comes Chris turning onto the pit straightaway. You can see it's only about the width of two of these rather wide Trans Am cars. Here he is hard on the brakes around turns one and two, that 180-degree hairpin onto 6th Street, heading toward what they call the yeses here. And the S is a rather flat turn in this course design. You see it in the right center portion of your screen. Quick little left onto that new pavement, then a right, and then a sweeping left-hander. That is turn number five, and a very narrow turn number six that begins just about where that bridge is. Then a little kink in the circuit, straightens out again, and then a 90-degree turn onto 4th Street. You're only there for a second or two, and then that left-hander onto Niagara. Chris accelerating through that little flick of the wheel called the S's, but there comes turn five, a decreasing radius left-hander, very tricky corner here, and through turn six, just a very fast right-hander now, hard on the brakes for the 90-degree right-hander onto Fourth Street, just a quick little straightaway, hard on the brakes, a left-hander onto the second longest straightaway here at Niagara Falls, Steve, Niagara Street. And on Niagara, Brock, these drivers will be in their top gear, but probably not at their peak RPM. That's going to come after they make this left-hand turn at the end of that parking structure onto Rainbow, 150, possibly 160 miles per hour down this sweeping long straightaway with the left-hand turn you take flat out. Here comes Chris onto that Rainbow Boulevard, the left-hander, and up ahead, as Steve said, the fastest part of this racetrack, up through the gears, he'll touch 160 miles an hour through this sweeping left-hander down this long straightaway. Well, if you've got the horsepower, the very wide Rainbow Street is an ideal place to pass. Now, it's hard on the brakes for a left-hander onto 3rd Street, right where that brown structure, multi-story building is. You're on 3rd Street for just a tick or two of the clock, and then that right onto Dugan, and then a very interesting left-hand turn that carries you kind of under the roof of the convention center. Well, here comes Chris, hard on the brakes for that left-hander at the end, end of Rainbow Boulevard. Here he goes, through that corner, down 3rd Street. You can see still how narrow the racetrack is. Here comes the right-hander onto Dugan, and up ahead lies a, yet another corner, a left-hander through this little tunnel, back on 4th Street, a short straightaway. This is where the racetrack gets really tight. Here comes a right-hander onto Wendell Street. There's the pit entrance, just a little short squirt up through the gears. One final turn, a right-hander onto Pitt Street, completing 1.6 very difficult miles here at Niagara Falls. Our thanks to Chris Nifel and the number 72 Pontiac Trans Am for that tour earlier. Of a very interesting course, Brock. A little something for everybody. There's narrow parts, wide parts, long straightaway, short stuff. A real challenge. Absolutely. As we get ready, there's the roll car, the number 14 Audi on the pole. Willie Ribs, number 80. 
Camaro gets underway on the outside of the front row, and there is the rest of the field starting to roll. Pruitt, of course, uh, no love lost between he and Willie T, Steve. Oh, they do not exchange Christmas cards, but they occasionally do exchange some paint, as they did battling for the lead on the last race of this Trans Am Series in Detroit, where the two of them got in a smash-up that allowed Hurley Haywood to sneak through the alley for the victory, so it cost both of them to get that physical. By the way, I blew it. I told the folks that uh, Pruitt was running a turbocharged Mercur. He's not. It's a V8, the only one in the world. There are two other turbo uh, Mercurs run by uh, Lynn St. James and Deborah Gregg in the field, but Scott's is a rare breed. In fact, the only one in the world, I think. Well, they say they sell those in South Africa, but I have to wonder about that. <laughs> But they changed the V8 for more torque on this very short, very tight course. There's Chris Neifel in our in-car camera. He's the number 10 qualifier. Chris uh, warming up the tires like everybody else. Gives a little wave as uh, he heads out onto this uh, very difficult racetrack. It's going to be mighty interesting to see how the four-wheel drive Audis work against the rear-drive American Iron exactly a Caribbean cruise, but I'll tell you what, it's one of the wildest boat rides in the world. This is the Maid of the Mist, a gutsy little boat that makes its way on a daily basis right to the base of these giant waterfalls. The current is terribly fast in here, very turbulent, and always the captain working those controls. In fact, this is edition number, I suppose, 100 of the, of the Maid of the Mist. They've been running these little boats in here for well over a century, and millions and millions of people have ridden uh, what is one of the most spectacular rides on Earth, Steve. And what a bargain at $5.25. Well, as you can see, race fans are finding the best vantage points over this 1.6-mile course as the cars of the Escort Trans Am Sedan Championship come down rainbow on their final pace lap. There's Rural uh, leading the pack uh, in that four-wheel drive Audi. A bunch of folks have turned out here as Hurley Haywood. Interesting, though, he's in the other four-wheel drive Audi, number five qualifier. He had some problems earlier, Steve. That's right, and that necessitated an engine change this morning. They had an oil pump problem, and rather than try to fix the motor in the 44 car, they just installed a new one. They got a whole trailer full of them. Well, this is a joint German-American effort. Uh, the Germans uh, designed and built the car. It's maintained by the Bob Tullius team from Virginia. They campaigned the Jaguars until this year on the IMSA GTP circuit. And the two drivers in those all-wheel drive Audis are the only ones out there that could care less if the pavement breaks up. They'd just as soon see it rain. It would <laughs> give them a bigger advantage yet. Well, Walter Royal's a rally driver. He'd just as soon have this thing run on dirt, Steve. It doesn't bother him a bit. The green flag is out for 150 miles of racing in the streets of Niagara Falls, New York, and already the combat begins. <laughs> you saw the brakes lock up there as Chris Neifel negotiates that 180-degree corner right at the end of the pit straight. Royal jumps out into an early lead. Willie T. ripped right behind him as they sweep through that uh, turn number five down through turn six. And Rural showing uh, early power here with his Audi, Steve. And in the blue number one car, that V8 McCord, that is Scott Pruitt. He's in the third spot trying to defend it against the 44 car of Hurley Hay with the other all-wheel drive Audi. Now right behind him in the only Corvette up near the front, the 88 car, that's Darren Brasfield. So those guys are starting to go at it for that third spot. In the meantime, though, Rural pulling away just a little bit on Willie really Here comes Scott Pruitt. There's the 44 car Haywood and Darren Brasfield down that big sweeper on Rainbow Boulevard where they're running just about at max speed. If there's one place on the course, the V8 cars ought to be able to run with the alleys. It's on that long straight, Rainbow and Niagara for that matter. Curly Hay with the number 44 Audi is in the fourth spot, but Darren Brasfield is just behind him. The Corvette looks big and bulky on this course, Brock, but actually it's handling very nimbly for Brasfield. Well, there's a major difference in these automobiles weight-wise because the bigger the engine, the, uh, the more weight you carry. So a lot of guys have chosen the V6s like Willie T to gain uh, a little advantage weight-wise. World car is uh, pretty heavy, though. It's a turbocharged automobile, and uh, the SECA uh, also assesses weight uh, penalties if you carry a turbo on board. The race for third, Scott Pruitt in the blue, number one car, the XR8TI, for lack of a better name. But it looks like these first few laps, everybody's being real careful. Well, this racetrack is so narrow in so many places that you really have to kind of pick and choose where you pass. 
as we watch the leader, Walter Rowe, now opened out a little bit. Here comes Willie T. There's Scott Pruitt. Here's Hurley Haywood. And finally, Darren Brasfield rounding out the top five. In the sixth spot is the number 15 Oldsmobile of Irv Hare. Just behind him is the number eight car, Les Ledley, the car owner for Willie T. Rip. And we are not right now riding with Chris Nifel in his Trans Am. He's in the tenth spot. And just in front of him, you can see the ninth place runner. That is number 16, Mike Sisuli. Here they go, through that uh, corner onto Rainbow Boulevard, sweeping down through there and trying to pick up some speed. Here comes Chris, that big sweeping left-hander, max speed, probably right on 160 miles an hour. Looks like he's going to try to get inside Sasuli. Whether he does it or not, oh no, can't do it. Sasuli shuts the door on him as they head down 3rd Street. Now, they're heading into the very narrow and very tight part of this racetrack, so I'm sure that Chris is just going to have to bite his time from here on in, Steve. He just stuck right in behind Sassouli, hoping that he has enough horsepower to get around him on a wider, straighter part of the racetrack. Well, Steve, right behind uh, Chris is uh, Bruce Jenner, the Olympic decathlon champion, in the team car to Darren Brasfield's Corvette, the number 88 car. His 87 car is a Camaro. So those two guys are uh, running as a team here as we watch uh, Sassouli bounce and jounce his way through that 180-degree corner at the end of the pit straight. There are some fairly substantial bumps on this circuit, as you'll find on just about any street course, because you've got the manhole covers to deal with, pavement transitions. They're part of this course that the Center parking lot. Again, we're with Chris Nibel in front of him, the number 16 Oldsmobile. Mike Ciasuli. Nibel getting aggressive now. Brock, he'd like to have that nine spot. Can't wait forever. Well, he's got a shot coming up through that left-hander onto Niagara Street. This is a fairly long straightaway. Not too much, but enough perhaps where he can get underneath uh, Sasuli. There is the trap speeds being shown here. As you can see, as they break hard, still running about 83 miles an hour. There they go on to Rainbow Boulevard. Now, Nibel, remember, challenged here. This racetrack opens out of here after that fast left hander, and perhaps he can get by under hard braking. Here he goes down underneath. Remember, he challenged the last lap. Here goes Chris, and uh, yes, he moves past Sassouli to take over that ninth spot. A very clean pass. He really saw him coming. Dewey he had more horsepower and was uh, braking better as well. He just didn't want to tangle this early in the going. So in the ninth spot now is our man with the camera, Chris Nightfall. Tremendous competition for the third spot there among three different manufacturers. Scott Fruit in the Lincoln Mercury car, the blue number one. There is Haywood in the Audi number 44. And getting just a bit loose is Darren Brasfield from Northern California in the Corvette. Well, Darren's got a lot of short track experience and loves the slide race cars. So it'll be interesting to see how he works that rear drive Corvette against that four-wheel drive Audi. Uh, of course, those Audis are supposed to have major advantages on short tight circuits like this. But right now, uh, Darren Brasfield has given Hurley all he asked for and then some. Well, look at Pruitt. Stretch it out there. There you see the big power of the V8 over even the turbocharged Audi. Pruitt definitely has an advantage on Niagara straightaway and also now on the rainbow. Right. Here they come onto that wider part of this racetrack. And uh, Brasfield now trying to push up and make a move on uh, Hurley Haywood as they come through that fast left-hand sweeper. As we go back to the race for eight, that is Paul Genelosi, the old Cutlass in the number seven car. Our man Chris Nifel, the onboard camera back there, right behind him. Genelosi won the first race of this series, Steve, and the Long Beach uh, Trans Am race and is running very well today. And look at this. Here is Nifel pulling up alongside Genelosi. Genelosi in the number seven car, and he's able to bend him off. Good job by Genelosi. Well, these two are moving up on the number eight Camaro, Steve. That is Les Lilly, car owner of uh, Willie T. Rift. And both Genelosi and Nifel seem to be moving in on him. Well, Brock, we're at the point in this 150 mile that a lot of drivers are now starting to show their hand a bit, kind of throwing caution to the wind and trying to get some positions. I mean, that's basically what it's all about. And they both, yes, they both get by Lindley. And that pushes Lindley back two positions in one fell swoop. Well, I think he's got some problems, Steve. He moved way out of the groove to let him through. So I would imagine Les has got some problems with that car. And down the pit straight they go. And look at this, Nifel diving underneath Genelosi in that uh, hairpin at the end of the pit straight. Can he get underneath them? Yes, it's a drag race toward the S's, and Nifel moves into the seventh spot. So he's picked up two places here in the tightest part of this very difficult Niagara Falls course. Stay with us. We'll be right back. For, for, for years. We got a little street fight going on right now on the circuit in downtown Niagara Falls, New York. Take a look at that. Garrett Brasfield has gotten around the all-wheel drive Audi of Hurley Haywood. There's the top ten. 
And we see our man Chris Neifel still holding on to that seventh spot. Right in front of him is Irv Hare and yet another Oldsmobile Cutlass. Uh, so we've got three Oldsmobile Cutlasses in that uh, second echelon, and uh, all of which are very, very fast automobiles. Well, the number eight, Yellow Camaro, that is Les Lindley. He's in ninth just behind him. Is the old number 16. That's Mike Ciasuli. Ciasuli is in the tenth position. Behind him is number 87, Bruce Jenner. Doing a fine job considering he didn't even know he was going to drive that car the day before yesterday. Has very little wheel time. In 12th and 13th are a pair of rotary-powered miles. It'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, that's uh, Roger Mandeville and Amos Johnson. We've seen those guys run for years in the IMSA GTU series. And uh, they moved over to the Trans Am right now and uh, doing a good job. And there is Scott Pruitt, the blue number one car, the defending series champion. He is currently in that third spot. Darren Brasfield is starting to show some muscle in that Corvette as it streaks by our camera. Pruitt and Darren Brasfield both grew up and started racing in Northern California. Scott Pruitt, by 1983, had won so many go-karting championships, they dubbed him the king of karts. And what a future he's got. You talk to the guys at Ford Special Vehicle Operations, and they'll tell you that Scott Pruitt fits into virtually every segment of their plans. Well, what a terrific battle between the Lincoln Mercury Automobile of Pruitt and Darren Brasfield in the Corvette. And Brasfield has a pretty impressive credentials himself. Back in 1982, his rookie year in this series, he was voted the rookie of the year. He's competed in the 200 mile an hour GTP cars. And look at this, he is right on Scott Pruitt's bumper. And it is Brasfield here that may have the better line. Brasfield is inside. He forces Pruitt. Outside Pruitt has no other way to go unless he wanted to make contact, and it's way too early for that. And look at Brasfield pull away, Brock. Well, the indications are, Steve, that he was being held up a little bit by Scott because once he got by him, he's really started to open it out as we watch him go from an aerial, go through that turn five, down through turn six, and heading toward that four street, a uh, 90 degree corner. Now, Let's see what Darren does with that Corvette as they go on to Niagara Street, where the first big straightaway uh, start. And look at this. He is opening out on Scott Pruitt in a big way. And, Brock, this is the one part of the course that Pruitt ought to be able to stay with him, match horsepower with him. Oh, in fact, right there, you can see Scott did pull up. So the Ford V8, the Chevy V8 appear to be pretty equal there. There's Hurley Haywood way back there in that 44 uh, Audi as we watch Darren Brasfield just blow away from Scott Pruitt and start to move in on Willie T. Ribs in the second spot, Steve. So Darren Brasfield is starting to really roll here. Yes, he is. And look at the smoke come off of that right front tire. This man is getting aggressive because he sees in front of him Willie T. Ribs. Willie is in the second spot. Brasfield closing in as they go under the convention center. Now, Willie T. has the Chevrolet V6. It is a V8 car for Darren Brasfield. But because of the rules, Brasfield's car is reasonably light, almost as light as Willie. And a good deal lighter than Scott Pruitt, which may have been the big advantage for Brasfield we saw earlier on when he got around through it. And now he is slowly but surely kind of reeling in Willie T. Absolutely. As they go down that George Strait behind the pit straight through the S's, here is Darren Brasfield moving right in behind Willie T. Ribs in that number 80 D6 Camaro. Willie T. Ribs from San Jose, California. Darren Brasfield, Los Gatos, just a few miles away. These two really grew up racing each other. They know each other's style and what they're capable of. Here they go on to Niagara Street. As we said earlier, this is one of the two real straightaways here at uh, Niagara Falls, and we'll see whether Darren can make it work. 98 miles an hour for those guys on that relatively short little straight as they squirt around the corner and head out onto Rainbow Boulevard, where if and there is any place where Ross Speed will play to Darren Brasfield's advantage, it will be right here through that big left-handed sweeper. Now, diving underneath Willie T. He's got the line. He's going to take second place. Beautifully executed passes. Darren Brasfield and his 88 Corvette move into the second spot. Only Walter Rural is ahead of him, but a pretty good distance out there. Well, Willie T. Rip has got to be a little frustrated because he was holding on to a really solid second place until all of a sudden Brasfield appeared out of nowhere. Let's remember, though, this is a 150-mile race. You've got to face the tires and the brakes on these cars, and that is something that Navy Pruitt and Willie are both doing now. Right now, let's go down to the pit area. Our partner, Paul Page, has a report on a car with some early problems already on pit wall. Oh? Well, Scott Sharp's Nissan crew has fallen over the car, and Jim Coleman is the engine man, and as you can see, he's doing his work now. They've gotten down on top of the car. He gestured at first when they came in and said, it sounds like they've lost a cylinder. Scott Sharp had reported by radio that there was a loud bang on the main stretch, and then the car began slowing down. But obviously, they've not yet given up on this machine. They intend to make repairs. This is a very long race, but it also appears they're going to have a very long stop. 
Well, it's a new opportunity for Scott Sharp, the son of team owner Bob Sharp, uh, who's taken over the seat of Paul Newman, who normally drives this car. Paul on location shooting a movie. So Scott Sharp uh, having a long afternoon of it so far. Here's a pretty good combat with the eighth position, the number seven car there, the red and white machine. That's Paul Gentiloti. Behind him, the yellow Camaro, Les Lindley. He's picked up the pace a bit in the last few minutes. And number 87, Bruce Jenner in that Camaro. I said earlier, Jenner did not have a lot of time in this car. Didn't even know he was going to drive it until a couple of days ago. But he is hanging right in there. Bruce Jenner has uh, turned into be a very good race driver over the years. He uh, came into the sport just kind of a lark running some of those celebrity races actually in Long Beach, California prior to the Grand Prix out there and got really hooked on it and has now come around to a point where he is very, very effective behind the wheel of a car like this. Well, it says a lot boring when he got the call when Jerry Grassfield, the father of Darren, couldn't drive that Camaro. He usually does. Had some business commitments, so team owner Tommy Morrison looked at the list of drivers available and called Bruce. Bruce is not glad he got the call. He's having a good time. So there, Gentilosi leads Lindley. We're right behind him, Bruce Jenner, and that little trio works their way underneath the convention center, heading down to complete one more lap here in this tight corner, uh, uh, heading on to Wendell Street, where the pit entrance is. And a lot of fans got to be wondering if this might be the point in the race where something develops between Willie D. Ribs in the number 80 Camaro and Scott Pruitt in the blue number one car. We talked about some of the difficulties those two have had earlier on. Well, Steve, remember, too, the car, the 44 car right behind them was the uh, benefactor of the last Ribs Pruitt uh, get-together at Detroit when, in fact, they knocked each other off the racetrack in the final lap, and the 44 car driven by Hurley Haywood came through to victory. And that made Hurley the only two-time winner so far this season. We saw him uh, in Victoria style at the Grand Prix of Dallas, and he struck from the very same position on the grid back in that third row. But well, right now, Willie T is uh, holding off through it, but I wonder, Steve, whether or not he uh, used up his brakes uh, trying to run down Walter Roll in those early laps. Roll, of course, has moved out to a really commanding lead at this particular moment, but right now, the stage is set for for yet another get-together between these two arch rivals. As the water continues to race just to almost as quickly as the race cars as it heads toward that big drop just above the American Fall. Here's some tourists uh, heading across the bridge toward Goat Island, which just above uh, the American Falls on the American side. That, by the way, is not the American Falls, Steve. Little trickle heading toward the big drop-off. Well, as far as the race standings are concerned at this point, here they are. Walter Rule still out in front. Darren Brassfield, a nice move in the second. Willie T. Ripp, Scott Pruitt, Hurley Haywood. That's the top five. Now, as we look at six through tenth, you'll notice a name is missing. Bruce Jenner in the number 87 Camaro. Well, while we were away, this happened on Niagara Street as they came down towards Rainbow. It was Bruce Jenner on the inside, the right-hand side of your screen, trying to get underneath Les Lindley in the number 8 Camaro. Now, this is off of Niagara, on the Rainbow, the left-hander. Bruce appeared to have a nice pass going, but he got in just a bit too hot, and there just were not enough brakes on the automobile to keep this from happening. Ouch. He got it into that very unyielding concrete barrier and really did some damage to the right front side of that Camaro. So Bruce managed, though, to lift the car back to the pits where currently his crew is uh, uh, unmasking a whole bunch of fiberglass. Well, you know, uh, Rock, they're not going to try to replace that. They're just going to get everything off of there uh, and try to make it as safe as possible and send it back out onto the racetrack. So Bruce Jenner will be in uh, what will look a lot like a super modified when the crew gets done. Right now, let's go to Paul. Was got charged. Well, now you're in the seat for Paul Newman. How are you going to explain what you did to his car? Uh, I don't know. I'm probably, he's probably going to be mad, but I guess it could have happened to him too. Let's hope he's not. You did a nice job for the time you were in. Oh, thank you. Scott Sharp out early. Well, what happened to the car? Scott Sharp had absolutely no control over. A connecting rod broke in that six cylinder Nissan motor, and when that happens, you're done for the day in any form of motor racing. Well, there's Paul Gentilosi and Les Lindley now uh, running without their old compatriot as we see 97 miles an hour on that relatively short straight as Gentilosi heads out onto Rainbow Boulevard followed by Lindley. Remember now, these two guys were in the mix-up with Bruce Jenner until uh, Bruce uh, had to uh, exit to the pit for a little... Uh, 
just roving on that Camaro of his. Paul Genalosi, he was a pro stock drag racer, got into road racing, and it only took him about, well, three years really to win his first title. That came at Long Beach this year, the opening round of the Trans Am. So he's still in the hunt for the overall series title. Only one driver has two victories. We mentioned Hurley Haywood. Here's the race for third. Willie T. Ribs in number 80 Camaro. Scott Pruitt just behind him and Hurley Haywood. Apparently, Willie's car is handling reasonably decent, Brock. That was a question mark going in after his shunt with the wall this morning. Well, yeah, he, uh, he has had a go at Walter Rural in the early stages and gave up second place to uh, Darren Brasfield, but now seems to be able to hold off uh, Scott Pruitt and uh, right behind him, of course, Hurley Haywood in the 44 car. Willie T. Ribb running in third place here at Niagara Falls, sweeping through that uh, little sharp left-hander and heading down underneath the convention center and now on to Wendell Street and just about to complete yet another lap here on this very tight, very difficult Niagara Falls circuit. Well, Willie T. Ribs is so strong physically, Brock, that even if the car's not perfect, uh, he can sometimes make up for that. He's the fittest driver in the field, no question about that. Look at Hurley Haywood came right up, almost tagged the rear of Scott Pruitt. Well, there's no question that the tactics of the Audi team is to let Rural act as the rabbit, to run out, just break everybody if possible, and let Haywood sit back and kind of move through the field with that very reliable, so far at least, uh, Audi. You know, the talk among all the drivers before the race this morning was not whether there would be a full course caution because of an accident, but how many would come in this race. So far, zero, and that is maybe going to upset some of the strategies being played out here. And in a race of this distance, a pit stop will be required. Everybody wants to make it under yellow if they possibly can. Remember, if a full course yellow comes out, it allows guys like Scott Pruitt, Willie T, to catch back up to Walter Rural. But so far, no cigar. You just saw Willie T clock at 92 miles an hour making that turn off of Niagara onto Rainbow, the fastest we've seen so far. Right now, Brock is with a special guest, the mayor of Niagara Falls, Michael O'Loughlin. Mayor, I guess I often wonder what uh, the reaction of a civic leader is when the first man comes to you and says, hey, I got an idea about running a race through your streets. What does, uh, what does a mayor of a big city normally say when that happens? Like hell. <laughs> <laughs> Except that uh, in a city like Niagara Falls, I think you have to continually try new things. Uh, we feel we're sort of an exciting place to come to. There's the beauty of the falls. That's a great attraction. But you also need those little extras to help bring people and encourage them. Most people need an excuse to go someplace, uh, good, bad, or otherwise. And I think this here uh, race, the Grand Prix, is a great reason, not just an excuse, to come to Niagara Falls, see the falls if they wish and the attractions here, but also enjoy great racing. It's exciting. It's tremendously exciting. It's been great. Oh, that's great, Mary. Now, the question is, uh, uh, are we going to see more racing in Niagara Falls? I expect that uh, June the 11th and 12th, uh, you'll see uh, just as good an event or better next year, and we expect them to be here the next five years. Terrific. Well, the best of luck, and thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Well, two guys on our team, I'm sure, would like to express their thanks to Mayor O'Loughlin and all of his people here in Niagara Falls. That is Galen Holloway, our chief engineer, and Don Flaggett, the video guy. Believe me, when you put 23 cameras in here, as they have done with miles of cable, you need all the help you can get from the civic officials. Thanks again, Mayor. Well, there is your leader. We haven't watched him for a while because he's been running alone, basically. Walter Rohr from uh, Regensburg, West Germany, three-time World Rally Champion, one of the finest drivers in the business. Uh, doesn't do too much road racing, and uh, when Joe Hoppen, the leader of the Audi uh, uh, racing operation in the United States, said he was going to put together a team, one of the first choices was Walter Rural, and he is proving uh, Hoppen's confidence with each passing lap. For that third position, the standings are unchanged. Three cars running in a train, the yellow Camaro, Willie T. Ribs, the Lincoln Mercury XR8 car of Scott Pruitt, and number 44, Hurley Haywood. Hurley stayed right, I believe, Brock, where he wants to be at this point in the race. Yeah, it's very possible, Steve. He might like to be able to uh, move past both uh, Willie and uh, Scott and uh, get that car up into uh, third spot. But right now, though, uh, it becomes a battle of attrition, whether or not those heavier, uh, more powerful uh, uh, two-bitter chassis automobiles of uh, Scott Pruitt and Willie T. Rips, the brakes will hold out, the transmissions. There's an awful lot of gear changing, awful lot of heart breaking on this uh, Niagara Falls circuit. So uh, who's to know what's going to happen? Attrition 
has been amazingly low, though, so far. Oh, yeah, everybody is looking for a yellow flag, uh, and they have not yet had one. And speaking of shifting, it is Walter Rural and Hurley Haywood doing the most of that. Those are six-speed transmissions in those Audis. They shift twice as much as anybody else. Yeah, you can hear Walter and, oh, here comes Bruce Jenner back in again with that super-modified Camaro, the whole nose gone. Of course, with a hunter racetrack like this, aerodynamics are not a major factor. You're not uh, running the speeds that will uh, make the big difference as they change once more the right front. And Bruce Jenner going to get back into it with that modified Camaro of his. Stay with us. We'll be back in Niagara Falls. Ten years ago, give or take a century, the Niagara Falls were seven miles further down the Niagara River. So there is a constant evolutionary process going on here as the falls continue to erode the rock from the top to the bottom. Well, while we were away, we haven't had much erosion here in the standings at the Niagara Falls Grand Prix. R Walter Raw continues to dominate as uh, Bradsfield, Riff, Pruitt, and Haywood round up the top five. Mike Sassouli in 10th, and uh, we've got our man Chris Neifel still riding along in the seventh spot, Steve, but relatively uh, uh, isolated from the rest of the field. Well, I think the question on Chris Neifel's mind and just about everybody in this field right now, Brock, is they've got to be thinking, wait a minute, I'm going to have to make a pit stop here somewhere. Uh, if I I ever seen a yellow flag, I'll dash in and do it. But uh, what if I have to go into green? Then what is the window there that I can get in and get out and have enough tires and brakes and fuel to go the distance after the stop? Well, right now we've got green all the way around this racetrack. It's been amazingly safe, other than that little shunt that uh, we saw Bruce Jenner have. It's been a very clean race. There is Paul Genelosi in the Oldsmobile Cutlass riding in the eighth spot. Well, you can see that his trap speed, as he brakes, that, of course, is under hard braking, uh, about 10 miles an hour slower than what we saw Willie T. Ripp record a little bit earlier. And as far as Willie T. Ribb is concerned, well, there he is. You just saw him go through, and then a yellow number 80 Camaro Scott for it, Hurley Haywood. These three just continue to stay almost arm's length from each other. As they uh, head down toward that little uh, right-hander on uh, 4th Street, and now we'll move out onto Niagara Street, the second fastest straightaway here. And Willie and the rest now closing in on some lap cars number nine. Jerry Clinton, he's in the 16th spot. A lap down. And we see the trap speed much slower there. That's because those cars racing for third are having to slow down rather than run to the back of Clinton. Debra Gregg is also in there in the number three uh, XR4 TI. She's in the 15th spot, also a lap down. Well, right now, Clinton has moved out of the way to let both Pruitt and Ribs by. But uh, Hurley Haywood is now trying to get by Clinton. There you see Haywood coming down to the end of Rainbow Boulevard, trying to get underneath Clinton. But Clinton in the number nine. Oldsmobile shuts the door on Haywood. So Haywood is now falling back a little bit in that fifth spot. But remember now, he was trying to hang right on uh, Pruitt's bumper, and uh, now he's got Clinton in the way. And now in a very, very tight section of the racetrack, it's going to be difficult for Haywood to catch up, which is going to give uh, Pruitt and Ribs a chance to break out a little bit here. So Jerry Clinton out of Maryland Heights, Missouri, is uh, maybe just holding up uh, Hurley Haywood just a little bit, although he's running in his own race and trying to run as quickly as he can. But Clinton again shuts the door in that uh, hair pit corner at the end of the pit straight. Early Haywood down low, heading up toward the S's. He is now getting a little bit impatient. Got out to brakes there hard, which he normally doesn't have to do. But remember now, Clinton is in a race with Deborah Gregg in that black number three for 15th and 16th spot. As we see Hurley Haywood now dive underneath as they head on at 4th Street. So he does move past Clinton and uh, begins to get a little open air now. Up ahead of him, though, Deborah Gregg, and I'm sure Deborah will probably move out of the way. You'll see in a rear view mirror that the faster cars are coming up. Look at this. It's Hurley going around Willie T. Ripp. Willie is slowing. There is Clinton on the inside of him. He's even going to go around and he's one of the lap cars. There is something mechanically wrong with that automobile, no question. Well, he's going to have to limp it back to the pits, in fact, if he can make it. As we watch Hurley Haywood move in on Deborah Gregg, she slides out of the groove, lets Haywood through, as we now see Willie T. Ripp move into the picture and running very slowly, literally limping his way towards uh, pit lane. So we will see him, no doubt, get into the pits, and uh, his crew will get that hood up right away to see if they can sort things out. Well, suddenly the car appears to be moving again at a pretty good rate of speed. Which makes me wonder, Steve, whether or not it might have jumped out of gear, maybe transmission problems, that uh, now Willie has uh, gathered it up again. Certainly going to head down for the pit as his crew will check out that number 80 Les Lindley owned Camaro, driven by the man who started second on the grid, Willie T. Ripp. Obviously disappointed right now. 
Well, as Willie moves down the pit road, the crew is already over the wall waiting for it. Uh, they'll try certainly to fix this automobile. Paul Page is down there. And here is Willie Ribs into the pits. His crew chief, Pat McCall, has a quick conversation with Willie, and now crew members jump everywhere looking for tools. Apparently, Willie will stay with the car. Whatever it is appears to be repairable. But now Willie Ribs shuts the engine down while the crew goes to work on the car. Okay, so that uh, essentially takes Willie T. Ribs out of contention here because a uh, pit stop of this length is uh, absolutely fatal to any chances to win, especially with the way Walter Rural is running and dominating the event right now. And there is Walter Rural so far. A flawless performance just in front of him is Les Lindley, teammate car owner for Willie T. Ribs. Rural trying to put him a lap down. And obviously when Lindley goes by the pits, he's not going to like seeing that yellow car. He owns Park there. <laughs> he sure isn't. Uh, and right now, Walter Rural uh, just kind of sitting back there, letting Les lead the way down Niagara Street because he dominates right now, doesn't have to hurry to stay out front. Stay with us for more of the SCCA Escort Balls on the Canadian side of the Niagara River. Just a sight that uh, just never wears out, Brock. And a permanent member of uh, one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Of course, back in Niagara Falls at the Grand Prix on the American side, we're watching Walter Rohr continue to dominate here. Darren Brassfield holding on in the second spot. Chris Nipo having moved up into six. Amos Johnson, a new entrant uh, uh, into the top ten uh, as he runs along in the tenth spot. And from our helicopter, that is really a neat shot as you see him running just under the rope line of the convention center here in Niagara Falls, New York. Of course, the big battle heating up right now is for that third spot between Scott Pruitt, the number one, the blue machine right there, and number 44, Hurley Haywood. Now you see 93 miles an hour. That is the speed of Scott Pruitt as he comes on to Rainbow, and you saw the much slower speed of the number 10 car, Jerry Coon, as he was being lapped. Now here is Pruitt. Now Coon is between Pruitt and Hurley Haywood right now. That's good for Scott. It could be bad for Hurley if he can't get around him on the wide section of Rainbow here. It could hold it. He is going to get around. Beautiful pass by Hurley Haywood in the Audi. As Gary Coon moves out of the way to let him through. So the battle for third continues. Of course, the man who was in it, Willie G. Ribs, is now parked in the pit. Let's go to Paul for an update. Well, this is Willie Ribs' problem. This is the handle on his gear shift lever. And he's apparently been shifting with such force that as he's thrown it forward and backwards, it's broken off. As a result, they're now trying to change it and get a new one in there so he can shift gears. But of course, while he's here, as you can see, the crew working on the car, he's losing a great deal of time in the pits. Well, I hope they found a stronger shift handle because Willie T. Ribs is an iron puffer from way back. Tremendous upper body strength. Walter Rules is also tremendously strong, even though he's tall and very thin. Anyone that can run those rallies that go for days and days across time. And look at the speed on Walter Rural as he goes into Rainbow. 116 miles per hour. But he has not turned the wick down one bit. Well, that's uh, 18 miles an hour faster than the last uh, fastest speed that we saw uh, Scott Pruitt put up. So Rural is running very hard, as you can see, virtually unchallenged. The car uh, is really the fastest on the track, without any question. He qualified a second faster than Willie T. But a lot of people thought, well, Walter's going to run real hard, and then maybe he's going to break. But, boy, there's no sign of that car weakening at all. And just behind the number 79 lap car of Robert Ripple, that is the race for the 10th position between a pair of Mazda automobiles, number 18, Amos Johnson, and 10, number 83, Roger Mandeville, in the 11th spot. Even though these two guys try to outrun each other always on the racetrack, in the pits, they're very good friends and confidants. It was yesterday that Amos Johnson came up to Roger Mandeville. It was tremendously hot yesterday, record in the 90s. He was having problems with the machine, described it to Mandeville, and Mandeville said, your fuel is boiling. And that's exactly what it was. He cooled the fuel down and stopped the problem. <laughs> well, it would take a racing veteran from a place like Spartanburg, South Carolina, to be able to figure out boiling fuel. But Roger is a kind of a newcomer to the Trans Am, and earlier Steve had a look. Roger Mandeville in his number 83 Mazda RX-7 with rotary power is an invited guest of the Sports Car Club of America today. He is, of course, a regular on the IMSA GTO circuit. He's always wondered how the Mazda would fare in Trans Am, and they've been curious as well. So on a one-race-only basis, they've allowed him not to meet some of the Trans Am rules. For example, you see how the body is tucked in here? Well, that's usually a no-no in Trans Am. They require it to come out to the outside of the front tire. 
but there are some things that he had to do, such as remove the side windows, which are legal in GTO and IMSA, not in Trans Am. Also, he had to shorten the rear wing. He could make it just a little bit wider, but it's definitely down in height. Also, in IMSA, they run wide open underneath the back window here. You can see he's had to add an aluminum kind of a package tray over all of those components. Now, it'll be interesting to see how the Mazda fares. It's a very fast car. It likes long straightaways. In fact, it can hit a speed of 195 miles an hour. But it has kind of a weird torque curve as uh, compared to a V8 or a V6. It doesn't have a lot of torque, as a matter of fact, off of the tight corner. So uh, it'll be just interesting to see how Roger fares today as an invited guest. Well, there you see the 44 uh, Audi of Hurley Haywood putting a lap on Roger Mandeville and on Amos Johnson as they continue to battle for that 10th spot. Those Mazdas, as uh, Steve said, uh, run very well on the longer circuits as Roger Mandeville blows past Amos Johnson to take over that 10th position. So uh, Mandeville may be starting to get that Mazda to work a little bit better uh, on this very tight, very uh, demanding racetrack. Well, it's very happy on the long straightaways. Uh, not quite so in the tight turns and Willie D is coming out of the car. It looks like his day is done. The broken shifter apparently could not be repaired. Willie D has unplugged his radio and is out of the car. That's a tough break and a very ironic way to lose uh, a race car just with a little tiny component like that but obviously on a racetrack like this if you don't have the shifter working you might as well park it. All right, this is for the sixth spot. Here's our man with the camera, Chris Neifel in the number 72 car. Ahead of him is Paul Gentilosi, the number seven Oldsmobile Cutlass. Neifel on the gas, trying to get up and take that spot away from Gentilosi. Well, the windshield is now really starting to get covered either with oil and uh, fluids coming out of his uh, engine compartment or perhaps from Gentilosi. But whatever it is, Chris is having some problems seeing, especially as he runs on the sunnier parts of this racetrack where the glare is becoming almost impossible but that's just part of the price of doing business in a race car and a lot of guys have to get used to seeing through the bugs and the oil and the generally smeared glass in front of you incredible fashion as darren brassfield tries to hang on the only two cars on the lead lap here as the uh, race unfolds between scott Pruitt and hurley haywood for the third spot well, there's one young man who wishes his name were still on that leaderboard. That big Willie T. Ribs, who broke the shift handle off of his Camaro. Paul Page is in the pits with Willie. Well, it's the end of a long, frustrating day for Willie T. Ribs. Finally, just broke the gear shift off in your hand? Yeah, yeah the gear shift lever will snap off. It must have been a weak part of the metal. And then you brought a new one in, and it looked like you were going to make repairs. What yeah. constitutes this decision not to go back? The new one, the new one would not fit. And uh, we were so many laps behind, it was not even worth going out there and trashing the car for nothing. The course itself, while you were running, is it fit? Are you in good shape? Oh, the car was not working at all. The car worked... Oh, we're great on right-hand corners, but on left-hand corners, were which side the damage was on, no, no good. Well, we're sorry to see you out so early, William. And we've got more trouble in the pits. Let's go to Steve with Chris Neifel in our camera car. Well, guys, this crew is going about servicing number 72, Chris Neifel's Trans Am, as if there was nothing wrong with it. But I got to tell you, the engine sounds terrible. And inside the car, Neifel, you see him inside. He's saying, guys, let's get going. He's clapping his hands, doing a little cheerleading for the crew. They had the hood partially up. Whether they found anything or not, it's tough to tell. We'll know by the sound of that motor when it leaves if they've cured the problem. Let's listen. Well, Steve, I don't think he has. It sounds as if that engine is just as ragged as it was when he came in. As Chris Neifel gets uh, back underway, takes that 180-degree uh, corner and gets back onto the racetrack, but he's still got problems, in my opinion. Talk about your narrow pit exit. You've got to be every bit as careful there as you do anywhere out on the racetrack. And here is the Paul Genelosi number seven car. Now, I would think that this is a planned stop for that team. It's about time for it. Well, it started as a routine stop for Paul Gentilosi, but now it seems to be more than that as the crew works at the right rear of the car. Gentilosi was running seventh when he came in here. Now frustrated, he sits in the cockpit, continues to rev the engine as they try and get the car operating. 
apparently satisfied that whatever was wrong at the right rear can be raced. They make a move to the right front, and tires being changed there as well. So the troubles mount for Paul Gianalozzi. He was running in the sixth spot and then was passed by Les Lindley just before he made his stop, which could possibly be the source of his trouble, Steve. Well, the last time around, Darren Brasfield, who showed him the pit sign, so the number 88 Corvette currently running second is going to be coming into the pit. Darren lines up. Yes, sir. This should be interesting to watch. Brasfield, an excellent team run by Tommy Morrison and a crew that has a lot of experience in all different forms of racing. Boy, does he come in hot. <laughs> Well, he's going to have to come in hot because any time they waste here is just uh, more and more costly for him because Rural continues to just sail around this racetrack and the pressure is maintained for his crew. There are the windshield being cleaned off. At the back, one of the two 11-gallon NASCAR-type dump cans is being uh, used to apply fuel. Probably take another one as soon as that's done. There it goes. Darren, even a glass of uh, water or whatever out of the cockpit. And look at this, Steve. That is the 44 Audi Turbo of Hurley Haywood, and he appears to have slowed down. That's right. It started to slow on Dugan Street. Hurley Haywood is limping this car around here now. Brock, the seemingly unbreakable out of these, well, one of them is broken. Darren wants out of the pits. He's saying, I'll drive with the dirty windshield. Don't worry about it. He is a young man in a hurry, Brock. <laughs> well, he gets impatient as all race drivers do, but of course the crewmen trying as hard as they can to hurry through their job. So he's underway. And in the meantime, let's go to Paul, who's in the Audi pits. And here comes Hurley Haywood as he rolls to a stop after on the course slowing without explanation. And they have decided, Grant Weaver, the rest of the team, that the hood has to come off. Hurley Haywood is gesturing frantically that he wants a clean windshield as well. As now they begin to work on the front of the car, and they're going to take a look at the engine on this machine. And the language being spoken in that pit right now is German. Almost all of those crewmen are from Germany. They'll be going back after another race or two. It'll be up to the American team then to take over the leadership on the automobile. Look at them just swarming all over that car. Apparently unable right away to determine what's wrong. And here comes Scott Pruitt. Pruitt, who is in the third spot. This is a planned stop. Pruitt in the third position when he came off the racetrack. But remember, he has a lap down. Now, here is the Jack Roush crew. There's none better in uh, all of this type of racing and performing very quick pit stops. Look at the tires going on, fuel going in, and let's again go back down to the pits and check in with Paul Page. Apparently, there has been a fitting that has come loose down at the back of the engine and allowed hydraulic fluid to seep out. And working at the edge of that hot engine, made doubly hot by the presence of turbochargers, they are trying to get that fitting closed as at the same time, the leader of the race, Walter Rule, comes into the pits. Now, this is a crowded situation. Rule is right at the back of his teammate's car. And again, it is Grant Weaver who is chiefing both cars that moves over and now gestures Walter Rural out on what appeared to be a routine stop for the leader. Well, as Walter was in the pit, you saw the blue car streak behind him on pit road. That was Scott Pruitt, who got back out of the racetrack and has unlapped himself. So, by all means, this race is uh, very much tighter than it was as the leader, Walter Rural, gets back underway. But he has not been able to maintain that full one-lap lead over Scott Pruitt, who can become a major factor now. What a series of pit stops can do. Darren Brasfield has fallen back to third, still on the lead lap. Bert Hare is on the lead lap because he hasn't pitted yet, and Scott Brew, with an excellent effort, is back up there on the same lap as the leader, Walter Rural. We'll be as I'm Brock Gates, along with Steve Evans and Paul Page, and Walter Rural continues to dominate, Steve. But in these closing laps, he has three other cars on that lead lap, that being Irv Hare, Darren Brasfield, and Scott Bruin. Everybody else is at least one lap down. Let's again go down to the pit area and Paul Page. Well, now for Hurley Haywood, finally there is good news. Nope, it appears not, as he's having trouble getting the car in gear now. They fired the engine, but he cannot force the engine to come into gear. And again, the engine is shut down as Hurley Haywood's troubles continue. And more so, this will hurt his points lead. He was leading the series championship up to this event, and uh, this clearly will interfere with that and also will prevent any chance of a 1-2 finish for Audi. As we watch an aerial view of Darren Brasfield in the number 88 Corvette heading down Rainbow Boulevard at speed. 
This car has been strong all day. Brassfield started sixth, worked his way into the second spot. Now has fallen back to third just due to a pit stop, but running very strongly. Earlier, Steve had a look at this car. Brakes and tires, two of the most important aspects in Trans Am racing, especially on the tight street circuits. The lighter the car, the farther both of those things are going to go, which is why a number of the GM competitors run V6 engines. The car is allowed to weigh considerably less. Now, Darren Brasfield, with his core, Corvette did not have a V6 available to him. So the story up in the front of this car, it is still a V8 engine, but they have removed the fuel injection and gone to a carburetor under that air cleaner. That allows them to remove 75 pounds of weight. Internally, in this V8 motor, it is low compression, nine and a half to one. That's worth about another 225 pounds. So by going to this particular combination, they've eliminated 300 pounds off the car, hoping for better brake and better tire mileage. And the nine to one motor can be a bit more reliable. The only thing that they lack here is that they can't get the engine set back like the V6 for a little better handling. Next season, Darren will have the option of V8 or a V6. All right, now it's working perfectly for him as we watch him open out. That is Scott Pruitt way back there in that uh, Mercure V8 uh, kind of modified hot rod that he's running. But then again, Steve, we're finding all sorts of odd engine and drivetrain combinations in this kind of racing. Oh, for sure. It's just a little gamesmanship, really, between the racers and the SET officials. The racers trying to find a distinctive edge, and the officials trying to equalize competition. Now, we are back again riding with Chris Neifelbrock, and he has apparently given it up. This car is just coasting, and is going to come, I believe, to a stop. He's out of it. As he heads up uh, through the hay bales and down an escape road, uh, he's going to have to park it. A tough wreck. We see, uh, uh, obviously, steam coming out of the engine compartment and into the uh, cockpit. So, Steve, uh, uh, he's just going to have to say goodbye. It was a good, strong run for Chris Nigel. Unfortunately, we can see the helmet coming off, and uh, no doubt, a uh, very unhappy young man. You know, we talked earlier about the engine sounding sour. I found out, Brock, that that was a broken header on the car. It wasn't affecting the performance, just the sound. But broken headers can do strange things. It may be a part of this problem, ultimately. I would imagine that it per perhaps burned a valve. Here we've got the 88 car of Darren Brasfield in the pit. Looks like a routine tire change, but... Uh, Things are going a bit slowly there. A lot of guys working around the car. It looks like right side rubber is going on, but not a particularly fast stop. That is Irv Hare coming in as well in the 15 Oldsmobile Cutlass. Remember, he was as high as second. That's right, and this is his first pit stop. Darren Brasfield, of course, had wanted to race to the checker after that one long stop. They've had some kind of a tire problem with that car. But for Irv Hare, he just ran it almost out of fuel to stay out there on the lead lap. This may put him down one. Well, you can see both of the Oldsmobiles in the pits right now. But uh, here goes Darren Brasfield underway and has fallen back to the fourth spot. But let's see what happens to Herb If they can make a good quick pit stop, he will stay up among the leaders. He's underway. That should hold on to that third spot for him at least. Irv Hare from a wonderful racing family out of Indiana. His father, Rudy, is the crew chief. They started in the Kelly American Challenge, won a lot of races, and have moved into a bit more sophisticated car. There is the tire that is off of Darren Brasfield's Corvette. That is what forced him back into the pits. And you can see they made some contact with something. Look at the uh, Goodyear. It's just about worn off the side. Yeah, that certainly was a, that's a scuff on there that must have uh, been involved in some kind of a problem out on the racetrack as the Goodyear tire engineer checks over the left. Here is number eight, Wes Lindley coming in, and that is not a routine stop. He had already stopped once before. They're going to put a dash of fuel on board, but the crew is now trying to remove the hood on that Camaro, Steve. Well, you can see the hood was loose when he came down pit lane. Apparently, he was afraid of it flying off, or maybe SCCA was afraid of it flying off. You can see the whole front end on that car is really not together as a unit. It is just about worn out. And here is Walter Rolls in the Audi. He is the leader, of course, and has been since we first saw the green flag. Walter Rolls, just an incredible performance. And while the rules is going into the pit box, Rurals is in for the second time. This is a surprise. Is it a scheduled stop or is there trouble? Let's go down to Paul Page in the rural pit. Well, here comes the leader of the race, Walter Rural, and what should be a very quick stop for fuel only. They didn't get as much fuel as they wanted in the last stop. And so now they come in, they splash just a few gallons.
gives a fuel into the car, and Walter Wuerl keeps the lead and heads back into the fight. He indeed keeps the lead with only eight laps to go, and that is not good news for the man in the blue number one car. Scott Root in the second position, but now Walter Rules has plenty of fuel to finish this race. Stay with us. We could dominate the Niagara Falls Grand Prix. Walter right now is running all by himself in that number 14 car. Everybody thought maybe he was the rabbit to go out there and just run it into the ground and take a few with him. Not so. That car has performed flawlessly. And in fact, for the story on the second number 14 stop, let's go down to the pit area and Paul Page. Well, that rather quick stop by Walter Rural was a surprise to everybody on the wall here. He radioed in and said he needed more fuel. Now, he has a little meter on the dash that tells him how much fuel he's used and how much is left. The other car, Hurley Haywood's car, is making plenty of fuel, no problem. But apparently, this machine metering slightly different. And so, as a result, they jumped on the car, just splashed a few gallons in, and sent him right back out, keeping him in the lead all along. And that huge crew was also able to get the 44 car of Hurley Haywood. Haywood back out onto the racetrack. He went a few laps down and is currently in the 13th position, but Hurley will salvage a few points for the day. Walter Rule, even though he's likely to win here today, is not the man out he plans to win the championship with. He will uh, alternate with other drivers in Germany. Right now, let's go to Brock Yates. He's with Bob Anderson, the vice president of SECA Pro Racing. So tell me just very quickly, uh, what is the role of the Sports Car Club of America in the, the formative stages as, the, as an event like this develops? How, how early in the process do you become involved? Well, this one developed a little more quickly than, than most. We've been talking approximately a year now, and we provide the organizational services, and we communicate and coordinate the insurance requirements, the FIA requirements, uh, provide the people to staff the event, and uh, get quite involved even in the design of the course. Just a quick uh, question about how many professional events uh, do you and your organization run every year? This year, I believe we're sanctioning 104 events, uh, some as the headliner and some as support races for other sanctioning bodies. Pretty busy schedule. Yes, it is. Well, let's get back to work. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bob. The leader, Walter Rule, the number 14 car, is on the last lap of this event. 96 miles per hour, the all-wheel drive characteristics of that car allow him to carry far more speed through the corners. Want to put a little zest in your weekend? Well, call that membership information number on your screen. That's the Sports Car Club of America. There are so many volunteer positions that can be filled, and from registration to corner workers to safety to timing and scoring, it's an awful lot of fun. You make a lot of new friends, and ultimately, you might even get involved as a driver, like Walter Rolls. He may be from Germany, but he's a member of the SECA. <laughs> and he is just about to win his first ever Trans Am race right here in Niagara Falls. He heads down to just about one more corner left here. Down Wendell Street, on the brakes, down shift, around that right-hander. Here comes the crew, the checkered flag waves. Walter Rowe wins it here at Niagara Falls. Flag to flag, one of the most dominating exhibitions I've seen in a long time, Steve Evans. Well, consider that he lapped everyone in the field with the exception of Scott Pruitt. That's a performance that will long be remembered. Walter Rule, three-time world rally champion.